This morning is from Colossians 4, verses 2 to 6. That's Colossians 4, verses 2 to 6. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. I believe there is children's church this morning. Yeah, okay, so ages uh, three to six for that. That's your girl. Before I go any further in my message, I just want to assure everybody that the water is not too hot, okay? That's just, <laughs> it's been tested. I don't know, maybe did Rainer test it yet? I don't know. I would if I was you, but I mean, it's good. It's good. Well, Dave and Jen Burley have made it here. Uh, looking forward uh, to uh, Dave starting up this coming week. And you know, uh, just this, this journey that has kind of started since last springtime in contact with them and, and the, uh, the setbacks and, and the whatever, the, the things that they faced, you know, it's just been assurance in, in my mind that God has indeed called uh, Dave and Jen here to be our leading pastor and wife. And uh, I think they've, they've experienced some, some spiritual battles. I think uh, what's, you know, that Satan's tried to discourage him, think, oh, what are you doing coming all the way out here to these bunch of yahoos, you know? Maybe a, <laughs> that's just Satan's voice, okay? <laughs> uh, but I think, uh, yeah, it, it's become uh, increasingly evident that uh, this is God's desire for our congregation. Okay. Well, I want to finish with uh, the book of Colossians that I've uh, been going through the last number of weeks. And I'll just give a question. Those of you who haven't been here, you can rest easy. I'm not going to put you on the spot. But those of you who have been, what is the overriding theme of the book of Colossians? A chocolate bar, whoever gets it first. Come on, kids. <laughs> used to work in, in kids' club. Yeah. No takers. Chocolate bar ain't worth it. Uncle David. The supremacy of Christ. Hey, he gets a chocolate bar. Supremacy or the preeminence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Hope you're not diabetic. No. <laughs> anyway. 
That's right. That was Paul's answer to the trouble that was in the church at Colossae. They were being tempted to be uh, led astray in thinking that Jesus wasn't enough. You had to do this and that. You had to do keep some Jewish laws. You had to, you know, elevate yourself to a higher spiritual plane by doing such and such. And he says, oh, you're missing the mark. Jesus is God's answer to everything. The supremacy of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God, who created all things, who keeps it all going, who became a man, who paid for the sin of mankind's, for the mankind's sin against God. And uh, that's the, the overriding theme of this letter. I'm going to just finish off. I'm going to start doing something. I hope all of you brought your Bibles. Anybody here not bring your Bible? Put up your hand. <laughs> Shame on you. Okay. <laughs> I've said it many times before. Going to church without your Bible is like going swimming without your swimsuit. Okay. <laughs> you should feel undressed without it. Okay. Anyway, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to turn to Colossians chapter 4 to that passage that, that uh, Charles read for us earlier. I'm going to start at the back. I would say not the back. I'm going to be looking specifically more in particular at, at verses 2 to 6. But verses 7 to the end are Paul's closing greetings. What he's doing is giving greetings, sending greetings from other people who are in Rome or who are with him there or who, who want to send a greeting to the church at Colossae, which is, I think, 1,500 miles away or more. It would have taken Epaphras, the guy who came to Paul, who was in Roman prison, it would have probably taken him a month to get there. You know, he had to walk quite a ways, then he had to get on a ship, and then he had to walk, you know, go for several days, maybe a week on a ship, and then he had to go uh, to Rome, another walk. And now he is uh, he's, he's ready to send the letter back, but it's not going with Epaphras. It's going with a guy by the name of Tychicus, verse 7. Tychicus is a fellow who's mentioned five times in the New Testament. He delivered letters to the Colossians, to the Ephesians, the Laodiceans, from Paul uh, while Paul was in prison at Rome and we find out that he was originally from Asia Minor the region that Colossae is located in we don't know if he was from Colossae or not uh, but he was from that region the next guy he talks about is Onesimus okay verse 9 and with Onesimus our faithful and beloved brother who was Onesimus well we find out from the book of Philemon he was a runaway slave who came to Rome he met up with Paul and uh, Paul discipled him and he is sending him back to his master Philemon and uh, he's carrying the letter he's helping carrying the letters to the Ephesians to the Colossians to the Laodiceans and to his old master Philemon okay. so Onesimus is the second guy he, that's sending a greeting while he's going to deliver it in person. Aristarchus is another man that's mentioned in verse 10. He's a fellow minister of the Apostle Paul. He was originally from Thessalonica. Uh, he was a fellow prisoner at Rome. We find out he's in jail too for whatever reason. And Aristarchus joined Paul on his third missionary journey. Another man who's giving a greeting to this church is Mark. That's Barnabas' cousin. Barnabas was Paul's former missionary companion. Mark had deserted Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. And Paul didn't want to have much to do with them after that. Barnabas wanted to bring him along on the second missionary journey, and Paul says, hey, we can't trust him. And the going gets tough. He's going to bail. And Barnabas was sure that Mark wouldn't. And so they had a big argument about it. Imagine that. Two of God's servants arguing with each other. It happens. It did happen. Okay. And anyway, uh, but now Paul has had a change of heart. We find out that he finds that, yeah, Mark is a useful guy to have around. God thought so too. He used Mark to pen one of the Gospels that we read that makes up part of our Bible. Okay? Justice. Justice, whose real name was Jesus. That would be almost like sacrilege, wouldn't it? 
Well, actually, Jesus is, is a, a form of Joshua, one who saves. There have been probably lots of people with the name of Jesus. In fact, you go to Latin America, there's lots who are named Jesus. They, they pronounce it Jesus. But uh, these folks, probably his name was Jesus, but hey, yay, we got to call him Justice instead. Probably similar meaning, but just sounds different. Okay. And he sends a greeting as well. And these fellows are Jewish. He says, these are the only Jews among my co-workers for the kingdom. And they have proved a comfort to me, is what the Apostle Paul says about these guys. He goes on. He talks about Epaphras. Epaphras was from Colossae. One of their own guys. He was the guy who started the church in, in Colossae. He goes to, to Paul, his, his mentor, to uh, uh, get some advice from, from Paul. And as a result, we have this letter in our Bibles today. He calls Epaphras a bond slave of Jesus Christ, laboring earnestly in prayer for them. Okay, a faithful servant. Then he goes on to Luke. Luke was also not Jewish, he was Greek. He calls him the beloved doctor. He was a close companion of Paul. He is the writer of the Gospel of Luke, he is the writer of the book of Acts. God used him. And then lastly, the last fellow he mentions as to give greetings to the Colossian church is Demas. He calls him a fellow worker. We find Demas's name again in Scripture, but in that context, it's not good. In Paul's last letter, his second letter to Timothy, we find that Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted Paul and gone elsewhere. Demas, who is a fellow who was in the thick of things, serving the Lord, advancing his kingdom, uh, gave up on it, thought it wasn't worth it. He loved this world. He's deserted. He's gone elsewhere. Yeah. And then those to be greeted by the Colossian church. Paul gives, sends a message. He says, uh, greet the Laodicean church. They were the church just up the road. We don't have their letter recorded in our Bible. Paul sent a letter to them. It didn't get recorded. It, I mean, it didn't get preserved. But it was, it was a letter of instruction. He says, you guys read the letter that I sent to Laodicea and send your letter or a copy of it down to them. They need to read it too. So he's giving instruction, greet the Laodicean church, greet a lady called Nympha, the church meets at her house, give her special recognition. And then lastly, he gives an exhortation to Archippus. Verse 17, he says, take heed to fulfill your God-given ministry. Archippus was probably a leader in the church at Colossae. It's a command, an exhortation, an encouragement, if you will, Take what God has given you seriously and fulfill your God-given ministry. It's good advice. Good advice. And then he closes with, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my imprisonment. Remember my imprisonment. Grace be with you. That is the end of the letter, but we're going to look more specifically at five verses, verses 2 to 6 where he gives closing exhortations, closing commands uh, to this young church, church that he hasn't even been at, he hasn't even seen. He's just heard a lot about him, they've heard a lot about him, and he's been asked to correct a problem in their church, or several problems. So he's, he's looked at how does this work in the church, how does our faith in Christ, how does the preeminence of Jesus work as we relate to one another in the body of Christ. How does it relate to how we work together at home, husband and wife, parents to children? How does it work at work for our bosses, or our employers in our places of business or work? And then lastly, he gives closing exhortations. The first one he says is, pray, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Devote yourselves to prayer comes from the Greek word proskaterio. I probably killed that pronunciation, but you get the idea. It's to attend constantly, to stand ready for. To stand ready for. Okay. And the disciples of Jesus at the beginning of the book of Acts stated that they would, what? Devote themselves to prayer and the ministry of the word of God. 
And so here the Apostle Paul gives the instruction for the believers in Colossae to do the same thing, to devote themselves to prayer, to attend constantly, to stand ready. To the Thessalonian believers, he writes, to pray without ceasing. Now, does this mean that spiritual Christians do nothing but pray all day and don't do anything else? Not for a moment. You know, we as Christians do have a need to spend regular, exclusive time with the Lord each day, hearing from Him, talking to Him, fellowshipping with Him, enjoying His company. Because even our Savior, the Lord Jesus, who is God the Son, needed that fellowship. His habit was to get up early in the morning, find a solitary place, and start the day in prayer to his Father. But as we go throughout the day, while we're working, while we're driving, while we're in recreation, we can still have an attitude of prayer. And often it's only a short sentence prayer. A word of thanks to God for appreciation for something God has given. Because after all, James says, every good gift, every good thing that comes down from the Father above. Okay. It's a gift from his hand. Any blessing we enjoy is a gift from God, and we can give thanks for it. I gave a short, thank you, Lord Jesus, just, was it yesterday, day before. I was working on an airplane. I uh, was in a very uncomfortable, bad place underneath the dash and crunched down, and I dropped a bolt, and it fell into the bowels of the flight controls down underneath the belly. And I looked for that bolt for an hour and a half because I didn't want it to eventually come loose and jam a flight control, which would have been very unnerving for whoever was flying it. It bounced in a funny way through a bulkhead, through a small hole and into another compartment. And I eventually found it, but praise the Lord, I didn't want to have to unrivet the airplane to find this thing. I have a cousin, when he shoots a jumper, he raises his gun over his head high and says, thank you, Jesus. You know, like, we thought it was a little excessive, but hey, he's giving thanks to the Lord. You know, it's, okay. So we can give a sentence prayer, a sentence of praise when we're reminded of God's prayer, a cry for help. What was Peter's prayer? Was it a long one when he was walking on the water and fell in? What was it? Three words. Lord, save me. Okay. A, a cry out for help. A word of repentance when we're, we've sinned and we realize it and, and we know we've, we've displeased our Lord. So being devoted to prayer means both having a regular, exclusive time of communication and fellowship with God, but it also means living in recognition of God's presence with us throughout the day and communicating with him. So Christians are to devote themselves to prayer and they are to do so by A, keeping alert in it. The NIV puts it, being watchful in prayer. You know, when I read this exhortation, I think of times when people weren't watchful or alert in prayer. And the obvious example is the disciples of Jesus falling asleep on the night of Jesus' arrest. Because Jesus had asked them to keep watch and pray, but they felt they needed sleep more than they needed to pray. Now, our bodies do need sleep. But too often, I find myself feeling the need for sleep more than I need prayer. And the truth of the matter is how much time we spend with the Lord each day comes down to a matter of priorities. And if we are not watchful or alert, prayer will become less of a priority than many other things. Our work, our family needs, even our church responsibilities, sometimes our leisure activities all have a habit of taking a place ahead of prayer. Now, a consistent prayer time is an important thing to keep. But it's possible to have a consistent wakeful prayer time, but not be watchful or alert. Sometimes our prayer time is the same old grocery list that we've been repeating for the last two months. Okay. And it's possible to pray just for the sake of saying, we've done our duty for the day, so to speak. 
So you see, there's a danger that we need to avoid in becoming like the Pharisees of old who would make sure they kept their prayer time out of a legalistic sense. But in reality, their hearts were far from God. An example of that is the story that Jesus told of the Pharisee and the tax collector who were praying at the temple, Luke chapter 18, and, and uh, he goes on and says, you know, I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like these different guys. He was doing his prayer time all right, but did it please the Lord? Mm, I doubt it. Okay. To be alert in prayer means to be asking, praising, thanking in accordance to the will of God, the desire of God. The Apostle James chided believers that he was writing to. He says, you do not have because you do not ask, and you ask and don't receive because you ask with wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Well, there's a second qualification to this command to be devoted to prayer, and that is to pray with an attitude of thanksgiving. Now, I'm pretty sure that this grateful attitude is not exemplified by the Pharisee I mentioned a few minutes ago in the story of Jesus, Luke 18. He says, I thank you that I am not like other people, like swindlers or unjust or adulterers or even like this tax collector. That was a self-righteous prayer. It was self-righteous pride. But the reality is thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is an integral part of effective prayer. Paul told the Philippians, he says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Okay. You see, God wants us to ask him for things. He wants us to have the things that are good for us. But he wants us to ask with a grateful heart, a humble heart. You parents know that it is much more pleasurable to give to a grateful child than it is to one who is demanding and ungrateful. And sometimes parents have to withhold what they wanted to give to or do for their children because they sense a spirit of ingratitude and their child needs to learn thankfulness. You know, it is the same way with us as God's children. Our ingratitude can rob us of the blessings that God wants us to receive from his hand. And that's why we're told to pray with thanksgiving. It is good for us and it pleases God. You know, at the beginning of this letter to the Colossians, Paul tells the Colossian believers what he's asking God, of God for them, how he is praying for them. That's chapter 1, verses 9 to 14. And now at the end of this letter, he is asking the Colossians to pray for him. You know, it's interesting that the spiritually mature Apostle Paul is asking a group of young believers to pray for him. These were Christians who needed direction. They needed correction. They were being led astray. They needed this letter to help them recognize and appreciate who Jesus was. They needed to be set straight on what was honoring to God and what wasn't honoring to him. They needed instruction on how to live as a Christian should. And many of these Colossian Christians were actually babes in Christ. And yet the Apostle Paul was not too proud to ask them to pray for him. I think there's an application here. No matter how long we have lived as followers of Christ, no matter how spiritually mature we may think we are, we can be benefited by other Christians praying for us, even if they aren't very old in the faith even if they aren't near as spiritually mature as we are, we can benefit of God's people praying for us. Sometimes a five-year-old child can have a very effective prayer for somebody who's walked with the Lord for 50 or more years. Also, conversely, we can benefit from the prayers of those who are more mature than we are in the faith. We can benefit from them. You know, in cleaning up my dad's stuff, 
uh, one, I forget who it was, one of my sisters or my wife, I forget, found a prayer that my dad had written out. I'm going to read it for you this morning because I think it, it, it would be a benefit. He wrote it out, I think it was for, that he was going to pray at uh, our son Matt's funeral. He says, Dear Lord Jesus, we need your special grace and strength for this time. We cannot see your plan or purpose, but we trust you for the outcome. For you are a gracious and just God, full of compassion. Knowing of what you have in store will far outweigh the pain and hurt that we are experiencing now. Thank you for your all-knowing ways. Give Daryl and Pat, Alyssa, Mark, and Amy, Emily, an extended family your peace and comfort as only you can give. We continue to pray for the Lowen family that has lost a young mother. We pray especially for the children. Heal those who are broken, those broken little hearts. Also for the Jarvis family. Draw them to yourself and give them a peace where there are only questions. And last of all, thank you for giving us Matthew. May the life that he lived. May the life that he lived bring many young people to yourself and bring hope bring honor to you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for all the support of caring people, of neighbors, friends, and family. In your name we pray. Amen. We're getting back to the Apostle Paul's prayer. What does Paul ask the, the, the Colossians, the Colossian believers, to pray about for him? Look at verse 3. He prays for opportunities to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have to remember where Paul is writing from. He's in a house prison. He is chained to a Roman soldier for probably all of the day or night. Probably just soldiers every eight hours or 12 hours just trade off. He is paying rent of that house. Other friends are supporting him. People can come and listen to him teach, but he can't leave. And I can imagine that living with a chain on could get very wearing after a while. Uh, he's already spent two years in jail in Caesarea, and he will spend another two in Rome before he's temp temporarily released. And Paul was used, was used to being able to go to where the people were. He's been preaching in synagogues, in town squares, or at river edges, wherever people gathered. But now, for the last four years, he wasn't able to do that. And people would have had to come to Paul, and the only ones who came to him on a regular basis were the Roman guards. Uh, they were a captive audience for sure, but Paul was used to giving the gospel to more and more people. And so Paul asked that they would pray and ask that God would give him opportunities to share the gospel. And secondly, he asked that they would pray for the ability, for his ability, to proclaim the gospel message clearly. We see that in verse 4 that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. He wants to do it so that whoever listens to him can understand the message of the gospel. He wants to be able to explain it in an understandable way so his listeners won't be confused. He wants to be able to proclaim the truth of Jesus clearly to everyone who will listen to it. You know, we all need a prayer like that because now we live in a world where there are thousands of ideas about how to obtain salvation or about how to have a right relationship with God or a God of many, many gods. But we need to be able to express the message of the gospel in a truthful, clear, and understandable way. You know, interestingly, at the same time he wrote this letter to the Colossians, he wrote to the Ephesians, he asked them to pray that he might have the courage and the boldness to declare the gospel of Jesus to whomever would listen. 
And so that's the third point. He says in verse 3, or in verse 4, in the way I ought to speak. And so he's asking for boldness to proclaim the gospel clearly. Who would have thought that Paul lacked courage? If we read in his letter to the Ephesians, it sounds like, boy, he's scared. You know, if we read what he says to the Corinthians, we find, boy, he fears, you know, Corinth, Corinth, that's a bad place, you know. I'm overwhelmed. He was too scared, but God gave him a very clear sign that, you know, you're here in the right place. Doesn't look good, but this is where I want you. And he needed encouragement. I don't know if any of you remember Pastor Bill McLeod from years ago. Was it with Canadian Revival Fellowship? A few hands, yeah. I remember him telling a story of how when he was in the military during Second World War, that he was prompted to go and share the gospel with a very big, mean-looking soldier who was sitting alone in a mess hall. And Bill was afraid to go because, in his words, this guy could have eaten him for breakfast and gone home hungry. Okay. And finally, Bill got up the courage to go and talk to this man, and though at first he got a cool reception, it didn't take very long before Bill came to understand that this mean-looking soldier had been under the influence of the gospel before and was right now wrestling with the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And as a result of Bill's initiative, it wasn't that long until that scary-looking scary soldier gave his life to Jesus Christ. You know, probably the biggest reason that many Christians do not share their faith is because they are afraid of the possible negative consequences. And Satan bar bombards us with thoughts that, well, people might be offended and we, they might not want to have anything to do with us after this. My peers will ridicule me. They'll make me look stupid. My boss will make life difficult for me. My neighbors won't want to have anything to do with religion, so maybe it's better not to rock the boat and not to push, you know. Those are thoughts that Satan puts toward us. And to be truthful, there may be negative consequences from those who reject the gospel of Jesus. But there will be much worse negative consequences for those who continue to reject the truth about Jesus. And the positive consequences for being a faithful witness for Jesus far outweigh the negative ones. In eternity, the positive consequences far outweigh any persecutions we will ever face for being a servant of Christ, for declaring his gospel. Twelve years ago, a 23-year-old man by the name of Shoaib, Shoaib Asadullah was arrested in Afghanistan for giving a Bible to a friend. Well, that friend turned him in as proselytizing. Shoaib had been a Muslim. He'd become a follower of Jesus. And while he was in prison, he was physically abused by the other prisoners. He received many death threats from fellow prisoners. Uh, he also feared that he would face a death sentence for his conversion when he was summoned back to court. And while Afghanistan's constitution at that time upheld freedom of religion, apostasy was still tried under Islamic Sharia law, which was punishable by death. And in a phone conversation with a Fred, friend, Shoaib said that he would not return to Islam uh, in exchange for his freedom, but he was willing to die for his faith in Christ. And this despite his family's pleading for him to renounce Christianity, his Christian faith, and to return to Islam. Shoaib's, Shoaib's Muslim father even spent most of his life savings trying to bribe government officials to release his son. Now, Shoaib was released after five months, after pressure from U.S. diplomats uh, who were kind of in control or helping the, the then government stay in control. And after that, Shoaib fled the country. Since that time, the Taliban have regained control of Afghanistan. And right now, it is doubtful that foreign pressure would make any difference at all to them of how they treat Christians in a similar position as Shoaib. 
In fact, I just read recently that Afghanistan has now become the most dangerous place in the world to be a believer in Christ, ahead of North Korea. And it's not because North Korea has gotten better. No, Afghanistan has gotten worse. We need to pray for our brothers and sisters in that country. In fact, the Taliban declares that there are no Christians in Afghanistan. <coughs> Afghanistan is a Muslim country. There are no Christians. There are. But they're going to be hunted down. We need to pray for them. Well, Paul... <clears throat> gives two more exhortations to the Colossians before turning to his closing greetings that we've looked at already. And it has to do with being a positive witness to those who are outside of the family of God. First thing he says, verse 5, conduct yourselves with wisdom towards outsiders or unbelievers, people outside of the faith in Christ. You know, Jesus told his followers that he was sending them out as sheep amongst wolves. They were supposed to be as shrewd as serpents, but as innocent as doves, Matthew 10, 16. And I think the Apostle Paul lived by that directive when he used his Roman citizenship to avert a whipping when he was in Jerusalem, or to gain better circumstances for a fair trial when he appealed, I appeal to Caesar. He could, as a Roman citizen. I mean, he spent another couple of years in jail, probably four, but I mean, he was, wasn't executed. He was allowed to go and, and uh, spread the gospel some more. But Paul also used different approaches to introducing the gospel to different people of different backgrounds. He used a different approach with the Gentile philosophers of Athens than he did with the Jewish God-fearers who gathered in synagogues. And it wouldn't be using wisdom in introducing the gospel to Islamic people by first burning a Koran uh, and then reviling Mohammed. No. Now, not that we should become wishy-washy about the truth and that we would give false assurance to those who've been misled, but that we give no unnecessary cause for offense. You know, some people will be offended by the gospel, period, no matter how you put it. They don't like to hear that they are sinners and on the road to hell. But if they hear it from someone who has demonstrated that they care about them, they are more likely to seriously consider it. And one of the best ways to prepare unbelievers for the gospel is to live a Christ-like life toward them. Also towards other believers, making the most of every opportunity. So the second exhortation is to make the most of the every opportunity. Some of your Bibles will have to redeem the time. Make the most of the opportunities that God gives you to be his representative. Paul told Timothy to preach the word in season and out of season. When it seemed like an opportune time and even when it didn't. And some people will think you're weird. Some people thought Jesus was weird. But if you follow up your words with the love of Christ in action, they will know that you have something that they need. That they need. Now realize not everybody will respond positively to the truth of the gospel. Many will reject it. But some will respond, and it will be a surprise to you as to who responds to the gospel. Don't sell the power of the gospel short. Just because someone has rejected the gospel at one time doesn't mean God has given up on him or her. Look at the example of the guy who was writing this letter. He was a highly educated guy from the city of Tarsus who hated the name of Jesus Christ and tried to do everything in his power to get rid of Christ's followers. And eventually he became a follower of Christ who gave his life for the purpose of proclaiming the very gospel he once tried to stamp out. Lastly, let your speech be seasoned with grace. The Greek word there is charis. It's also interpreted as kindness, favor, blessing. And one of the best ways to act in wisdom toward the unbelieving world is have grace-filled speech. Speech that speaks the truth, but it speaks it in love, does so in love. Speech that builds a person up instead of tearing him or her down. Speech that honors God. Speech that doesn't need to be apologized for anywhere. You know, I'm guilty of this, and I think probably some of you are too, is 
compartmentalizing our speech. As our speech at church isn't quite the same as our speech at home, or our speech at work, or our speech at leisure, or our speech when we're beating the living daylights out of a cow, okay? Speech that sets a believer apart from an unbelieving world. You know, some unbelievers, through sheer self-control, have more grace-filled speech than some believers that I know. Met a few guys, they come to look at an airplane and I visit with them for a while and their speech was impeccable. I said, I've noticed by your speech, you don't use God's name in vain, you don't use any curse words. Are you guys Christians? He says, no, we're not. There was an opportunity to talk about it, but he was, he was, he was I guess they just had self-control, you know, in, in their conversation with me, it was, it was impeccable. Yeah. Well, God desires grace-filled speech. Uh, if through crudity or something, the way we, way we say something, we are offensive to someone else, guess what? It's sin. And so here's a good rule of thumb. If we change our talk when we come to church then our talk in general needs to change. Amen? Yeah. Well, in summary, Paul says, devote yourselves to prayer. Keep alert in prayer. Give thanks in prayer. Pray for others, for believers and unbelievers, for opportunities to share God's truth clearly and with boldness. Act with wisdom towards unbelievers, towards outsiders. Make the use of the opportunities that God puts before you as his representative. And make sure your speech is always with grace toward everyone. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for inspiring your servant Paul to write this letter to Colossian believers who lived a couple of millennia ago. And we thank you that you've preserved it for our instruction, for our correction, for our encouragement. And Heavenly Father, we ask that you would help us to live out the fact that you are our Savior and our God. Help us to live it out well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask the worship team to come lead us in a song before we go into our baptism service.
thank you. You may be seated. A little while back, Rainer came to me and asked if that he'd like to be baptized. And that's great. It's, it's not a part of his salvation, but it's a declaration of what's already happened uh, when he came to faith in Jesus. And uh, Rainer just being obedient to God's command to, to be baptized as an identification as a follower of Jesus Christ. And so we rejoice with Rainer this, this morning and in the future. And so right now we're going to ask Rainer to come up and share his testimony with us. Good morning. Um, give me one second. All right, um, my name is Rainer Suderman. My parents are Darlene and Chris Suderman. Born and raised in a Christian home, although I attended church through my life, I never disciplined myself to listen to God's word, commandments, and will. A big part of life is work, and through the blessing of work, I got to spend time thinking about God. Through this meditation of God and his word, I started to grasp the idea of grace as well as wrath. God opened my eyes to see what is true and what I was blinding myself with. Um, although my walk with God is young, and only recently have I, and only recently, I have yet, I have let God be number one in my life. I'm sure of my faith and want to publicly declare God's washing and cleansing of my soul. The verse I chose is Jude 1, verse 24 and 25. Um, in my Bible, it titles this passage, The Doxology. This isn't one I'm aware of, but I like it quite a lot, and I think it can provide clarity. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory, with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, both dominion, both majesty, dominion, and authority, before all time, and now, and forever. Amen. It's been our practice in our congregation to have a, a friend or somebody close to the person who's getting baptized to come and give a word of encouragement. So I'm going to ask Jake to come and do that right now. Good morning, everyone. Greener. A young man making a public stance for the Lord. Showing the people here today that you've committed your life to Jesus. It's a step of obedience, Rainer, that the Lord calls every Christian to do. I'm proud of you for listening to the Holy Spirit in your life. This wonderful Savior that we follow, the one and only Jesus Christ, he laid down his life for us. What a king that we have and as children of his we get to reap the rewards of what we don't deserve one of the rewards is eternal life after we pass on from this one but Rainer as I also want to encourage you what the Lord has for you now there isn't a moment that goes by that we don't need to make decisions and lots of the decisions uh, that we make are not that big a deal. But we make them on a daily basis. But on the other hand, there are many decisions that can become a big deal. What I'm getting at is that as a believer, you have received the Holy Spirit in your life and you are no longer a slave to make sinful decisions. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than that you can bear. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. So even simple things like our phones, we have everything at the tip of our fingers. It's, it's a decision that you always have to make. Do I click on this? Do I click on that? 
And so it's always there. And God gives us a way to, to choose the right thing. What a promise that God has for you. When you come up against some hard stuff in your life, and you will, you, Rainer, can be reassured that God has made a way for you to choose him every time versus choosing what your sinful nature wants to choose. I also want to encourage you to spend time in God's word so that you are equipped to face life challenges. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17 say that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Knowing that the scriptures are God-breathed means that we can trust them 100%, without a doubt in our mind. He has given you instructions for life right in there, Rainer. That means studying his word is vital to your relationship with God and knowing who he is so that when everything in life hits you hard and people try to distort who God is and what he has done for you, you can put it up against truth, the Bible, and be reassured that God loves you and he died for you. And the Lord wants you to share that with others, telling people who Jesus is. Serena, I pray that the Lord will bless you and that he'll make you a blessing. If you want to come up here, Rainer. Just going to ask you four questions <clears throat> before we get you wet. First of all, do you believe that Jesus Christ is God the Son, that he died on a cross, rose again after three days, and has ascended to sit at the right hand of, the fa of his Father in heaven? If so, answer, I do. I do. Secondly, do you accept Jesus' death on the cross as full payment for your sin debt before God the Father? If so, answer, I do. I do. Thirdly, do you repent of your sin against God, and do you desire to live a life of obedience to his word, the Bible, and follow the teaching and example of the Lord Jesus Christ? If so, answer, I do. I do. And lastly, is it now your desire to publicly identify as a follower of Jesus Christ through the act of being baptized in the name of Jesus? If, okay, <laughs> very good. I like someone who's eager, yeah. I'm going to call up uh, Rainer's dad, Chris. We kind of had it a tradition to have somebody who has been a, a big influence in your life help baptize you. And so Rainer has asked his dad. I think that's very appropriate. And so now we're going to do it. <laughs> Rainer Suderman. Because of your confession of faith that you have put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. unconventional but I just had a couple of words I'm an unconventional guy uh, just a big thank you to everybody that's had a part in Rainer's life uh, the problem with making lists is they're not exhaustive but I mean it's it's pastors it's Sunday school teachers it's VBS it's um, youth leaders family on and on and on it goes um, primarily Rainer's mother, um, you've been huge, so <laughs> can't leave that out. Um, but yeah, just a, a big thank you to, to everyone. It's, it's primarily the home, but we all play a part. Thank you. Okay, worship team. <laughs>
in just a few moments, I believe Rainer will be coming back up here to uh, receive. If you want to give him a word of encouragement, it'd be a good time. He's right off with that thing. Benediction is from 1 Thessalonians. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. May your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you, he will also bring it to pass.